Hey there, guys. It's been a while. My name is John Henry Sheridan, and I am a human being on planet Earth at a very unusual and unprecedented time in our human history. So thank you for watching this. Um, uh, this is my Thoughtful Pause series, uh, which I stopped a couple months ago, and now I'm, -continu I'm continuing. It's just something I feel um, compelled or inspired to do sometimes, and I'm just going to move forward with it. So today I want to present with you an idea, uh, which is the title, it's not supposed to be clickbait, but it's, it's a question that, I, you know, when I think it poses a question, it seems like, of course, we know the answer. But without posing it in such a clear way, maybe it's like a subconscious belief system that some of us may still partially or completely buy into. So anyway, the question is um, this. Uh, let's see. Is convenience the meaning of life? Is convenience the meaning of life? I think anybody who spends a few minutes thinking about it, or in a few seconds, probably know that convenience is not the meaning of life. Now, um, I'm not going to say I know what the meaning of life is, but it, it's not that, right? <laughs> um, or to put it another way, uh, is... Uh, is being comfortable all the time the highest uh, value we can achieve in this life or the highest state we can achieve in this life to be comfortable? And comfort and convenience are not the same thing. I'm not saying that. But they're certainly connected. Um, so I'll just throw a little bit of my own personal history to call this a little bit and why I thought it would be good to bring it up. So I understand that in these days with the whole COVID, the virus, I don't want to get into it so typical. Every single video on, on online nowadays mentions right COVID, the virus, a lockdown or something. And um it's in a reality on one level or another, depending on where you're at in your life or where you live in the country or the world. Uh, so what I'm noticing is there's a lot of things shuffling around in our reality, um, our shared collective reality. Now, I do believe that each one of us has our own particular reality that we do not share with others, which is our own individual experience, but we also have that shared common reality that we all do collectively uh, share. Um, so I do believe that I am 100% responsible for my reality, uh, and I'm not forcing that on anyone, but that's how I feel, and that's an empowering way to feel. It doesn't necessarily mean I control everything that I see, but it does mean that I'm in control of how I can respond or react or not react to uh, events in the outside world. Certainly being in lockdown or, um, you know, being at home more, we have, some of us have more of a chance to self-reflect. If you can do that, that's great. I recommend it. If you could do a little bit of that in nature too. That could be a nearby park. That could just be outside by a tree. It would be wonderful if you could actually be on a nature trail. I recommend it. So, 2009, January, I went to India on a study abroad with Brooklyn College. And while that was incredible and it was life-changing, and I would love to go to India again, in this before I die, um, it was not super convenient 
It was not. It was difficult physically for a Westerner, for sure. Uh, you know, the, the toilet practices are different. Um, not always being able to trust what you're reading. That's not convenient, right? Uh, I remember sometimes ordering a coffee and I wasn't sure if I was drinking tea or coffee because there's the same color. It's like light brown <laughs> and served in the same cup and usually sweetened that. I, I really almost couldn't tell sometimes if it was chai or coffee. Uh, not so convenient for someone who loves their coffee, you know, every day. Um, okay. And then I, I actually, not, not only did we see how the more upper class lived, which um, in some ways was also not so convenient, but then uh, I had the chance to go into like some very tiny village where, um, what do you call it, like a shanty town type of thing where they just built something, you know, without legal rights or whatever. And so was, they were always afraid of being kicked off, that type of thing. Um, they just built on uh, open space these really ramshackle huts. And people would live in this. Families of three, four, seven would live in a room that's, you know, probably smaller than the average American's bathroom. I would say for sure smaller. Um with the roof, you know, like this and no running water, not convenient. So convenience certainly cannot be the meaning of life because they don't have the convenience. So they have no meaning in their life? No, of course, but uh, that's not true. These children that were living in these shanty towns for lack of a better word, I'm sorry, I can't think of a better word. They were very rough and tumble living uh, spaces um, smiling, they had uh, no shoes on their feet, there was garbage glass on the floor, playing uh, joyfully. Um, we learned from a woman nearby who helped the children in the area and was an educator that these children not only had no interest in TV, like if they came to someone's home who allowed them in, they had no interest in TV, they had no interest in stealing anything. It, it almost didn't occur to them because they didn't place value there on those material things. And also, what you're going to take it home to this tiny hut, you can't hide it. So um, they were not, uh, they didn't have the delusion that being, having things super convenient was going to improve their life in any way. They just had each other. You know, that was the main thing. Uh, then, you know, fast forward a year later, I would go to Brazil. And then uh, I become a humanitarian volunteer in Brazil, inspired by the India trip, by the way, which is why I wanted to become a humanitarian volunteer. And here we are living in this small village called Lagoa de Baja. And if you're from Lagoa de Baja, uh, this is, and you understand English, this is in no way... Um, anything uh, negative about it but it is there's a difference between a small village in uh, the interior of Bahia and you know people who live in a house in Brooklyn there's a very big difference so there there was no in terms of convenience there was no running water you, technically there kind of was there's like kind of a faucet but the water was coming from a tank on the ceiling right on the roof from collected from rain so that was very often dry <laughs> so it wasn't really running water right but it could like run through a faucet to be a little more convenient but it was not something you could depend on it was something that could run out quickly and then you go to your neighbor <clears throat> your neighbor's um well type of system i forgot the word for it and you throw in a bucket and you collect water and then when you take your showers and you got to like wheel it back on bumpy roads with flip-flops, right, in a wheelbarrow, these heavy, heavy things of water. Put it in your tank, in, which we had in our backyard. And uh, then 
before we take a bucket shower, we would uh, filter out the bugs by putting a towel on top of the one bucket. Here's, here's a bucket, and here's another bucket. And you put a towel over it, and you pour the water so you, you get all the bugs to stay on the towel, so you get relatively clean water to take a shower. And the water is, even though Brazil's super hot in that area, um, the water was kind of cold because it's sitting around night and day. And uh, you just dump it on yourself little by little because you got to go fetch it physically, right? It's not just going to come through the pipes. Um, there were bu many bugs in the house. We slept in mosquito nets. And all this to say, uh, oh, there was no s very little cell phone signal. We did not have cell phones on this trip during this time. Uh, I didn't. I don't think any of my teammates did. Yoko was with me. She didn't. We had no internet uh, in this village. We could access it once a week when we went to the town. Um, there was only a bus that went once early in the morning and then came to take the kids back in the day. So you can go to town if you got up early enough, but you'd have to wait to come back uh, pretty much the whole school day. So this is not a complaint. This is not bad. Uh, this was very amazing, wonderful time in my life. It was, it was many challenges I never faced before, but it was so rich, and I got to meet so many people and create real human bonds that to this day, 10 years later, we have a heart connection with many of the people from that village. So I want to just take you on that little bit of a journey because, um, you know, I think many of us are being shaken up these days by uh, changes in society losing a job or having our job ch change shape, um, certainly financial concerns, you know, where, where's the money coming from to pay all these high bills, especially if you're living in a place like New York City, is unemployment enough or then what's, you know, what's it going to look like in a couple months from now, you know, are you getting unemployment or uh, family support, do you have um, savings, can someone help you or not? There's a lot of questions people are having. So I want to just put you at ease if I can to some degree that I saw that living in this village in of Lagoa de Baja, Brazil, so many people who were very, uh, had very little money. You know, I clearly knew they explained to me what they made, and I saw the house they live in. They had a house, very humble homes, and often had a TV, which the government had given to them. Uh, very sketchy electricity that was like these wires that were hanging that, I don't know if it's a professional who put them up somehow, you know, I definitely saw people getting shocked, including myself. Um, but you know, they had enough things to kind of enjoy their life. And um, that's the point. I saw people who knew that they were not going to be rising up on the economic chain in their lifetime, who were just living their life and smiling, enjoying nature, enjoying playing soccer. Even adults would go out and play soccer like every day at 5 p.m. <laughs> of many of them. Uh, and kids, of course. And and, and in nature, there, there were certainly um, problems, right? And that was part of the reason we were volunteers, to assist in health issues and teaching things that they couldn't get access to learn otherwise. But also to very much sort of learn from them and the way of li their way of life. Um, what I saw was this. It was like an epiphany. Wow. We in the West think we have to have X amount of money in our bank account before we can feel comfortable and relax or, or have children, start a family or whatever kind of strange ideas we have. And when I saw people there in this village, also I saw in India, their mind does not work that way. It's not, I, I can't even describe how different their mind works, but it's, they're not thinking about bills It, they're thinking about daily life, 
and what do they got to do today? And it was very, uh, not quite unpredictable, but the planning that we're used to in our strict, rigid schedules here in America, and certainly I then lived in Japan, they're very tight scheduled. Brazil's schedules are very loose and flexible, at least in the, the these parts of Brazil. You have start a plan to do something important at 8 in the a.m. in the morning, and maybe it happens at 9. Maybe they cancel it. No big deal. So, but life goes on, and then you just make do. And you don't have uh, the, the number of bills that people like, complicated societies like us have right you have your lights you don't even have you don't have a water bill you know because you you have water <laughs> you know i'm not saying it's better but they were happy and and what i mean by that is they were smiling they were healthy there were health issues too of course but it, i did not feel like the people that i met in that small village were any worse off than the people I know at home in Brooklyn with houses and hot showers and access to the internet and games and all. I didn't feel like the people that I knew here in New York City were more, um, were happier. I think that's the point, they weren't happier. Some people are happy here and some people are happy there, but I even thought having less in some way, was, I don't, wouldn't say ignorance is bliss, it's more like circum accepting circumstances can bring a certain deal of uh, contentment. And going back to the theme that I brought here is that uh, is the meaning of life convenience. And if you have less convenience in your life, I don't think you really, you probably don't tend to think that way. <laughs> that it's life is supposed to be super convenient, but when you have so much convenience in your life. We think when it start when there's threats of it being removed, having less of it, that um, somehow that's wrong. I don't think it's wrong. Uh, I don't want my water to be taken away or my electricity or my internet, but um, I, I, I definitely don't want to live in fear though either. So uh, one thing I keep hearing, um, I follow a guy named Infinite Waters by following me, and I check out his videos often and I'm inspired by him uh, you can find him on YouTube or, or Facebook infinite waters uh, he always says let love guide you not fear it's not his original thought that many you know spiritual teachers would say that but I like those words let love guide you not fear and I think that's really what we got to do nowadays and remember that convenience comfort is not the meaning of life so if we're getting shaken up a little bit how can we grow from this? How can we use this opportunity to take our spiritual evolution to the next level? Because we really do have infinite potential as beings. That's all for today, guys. I'm not sure when I'll come back with one of these videos. I had it in me to share tonight. Until next time, take care of yourselves and love yourself first. Really love yourself with love. And then your light will shine forth naturally. Take care.